It's time for Bravo with Sheila, a place to be enlightened, a place to be built up, and always a place to remember that when nothing changes, nothing changes. Hello, hello. We are here. We are here. We are here. Welcome to Bravo with Sheila on the Bravo with Sheila Network. You know how we do. We love to be here with you. If you have not given yourself a Bravo today, I want you to touch your mind, your heart, your soul, wherever you need encouragement and give yourself a Bravo just because you do not need a reason. You do not need permission. You just go ahead and give yourself a bravo. It is a cool, nice day here on the East Coast. We are here. It was raining today, but nevertheless, we woke up and we're still here. And we're grateful, grateful, grateful to be here today. You know how we do here. As soon as we come in the room, we hit that thumbs up button. It is free 99. So go ahead and hit that thumbs up button because it helps to push the algorithm. Just move this pro this content across the way, right? And so we're trying to grow this channel. We are almost, almost, almost at 1,000 subscribers. Help <laughs> us get there. Help us get there. My guest tonight, I tell you, I'm so excited. This beautiful jewel of a woman, her name is Madeline Aragon, and she is a CEO and founder of State Space Group LLC, mental health clinician, LAC and grief specialist. She is also an author. Listen, she is incredible. I can't wait to yield the floor to her. She's empowering individuals to thrive through compassionate mental health support. And I am, she says, she says, I am dedicated an empathetic mental health clinician who is passionate, who is passionate about helping individuals navigate. That's a good word. I mm -hmm. love the word navigate. You got to navigate, right? Life's challenges. And I am committed, she says, to providing a safe and non-judgmental space for clients to explore their thoughts and feelings and emotions. Welcome, welcome to Bravo. Once again, this is your second time. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, I'm excited that yeah. you're here. I'm so excited. You're in a field that I've been in for a long time. You are doing things that on a whole nother level, but you know, whether you're a mental health a therapist, counselor, coach, mm -hmm. whatever, we care for people. We try to handle people correctly. We know that life happens and it affects us. And many times we need a help a push and some information to get us through some trying times and to prepare us sometimes for what is inevitable to come. So I want mm. to talk about mental health. I want to talk about grief because that is what you wanted to talk about. So tonight, mm. ladies and gentlemen, I am yielding and yielding. I'm right next to her, <laughs> but I want to give her the opportunity to share from the cup of her life and to share from her heartbeat what it is and why she decided to get into mental health, how she's talking to the youth, the people that have come through her path, how she sees things happening and what she thinks we need to do. Pache is saying, hey, Maddie, hey, hey Maddie. Hey, <laughs> hello, Pache, hello. Pache is saying, hey, Maddie. Hey. Thank you for tuning in. 
Yes, yes. like you said, it the grief is such an uh, a universal emotion. And um, for me, coming into the mental health field, um, I I decided to come into the mental health field because I I noticed that after COVID there was a shift, right? There were so many who were suffering from loss, right? Loss, normalcy, things that they once used to do, um, they no longer could do. Loss of health, right? Yeah. Um, so I headed towards the mental health field in such a way that I was focused on grief. I became, um, that was my specialty. Um, right now, as a mental health clinician, I work with adolescents and teenagers, and they are suffering with grief till now. So we see that um, grief not only hits adults, but it also hits children and teenagers. For example, I have, um, I see a teenager who is in her last uh, senior year of high school. She um, was a great cross country runner and great student, but she was feeling down and she was feeling off and um, she couldn't understand why. And when I explored a little bit more with her, she told me how she ended her cross country season she um, is no longer running and she felt sad. She felt like she lost something, a part of herself. And when I talked to her and listened to her, I ended up realizing with her that I actually, I had her realize that she was suffering from grief. Those mm. things that she once used to do, she no longer is doing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it hit her, it hit her. She was like, really? But I thought grief was just, was about loss. No, grief is not just on for a loss or death. It's also those intangible things, right? The loss of normalcy, schedule, those things that you once used to do. So in my field, I'm seeing that I also deal with students that are also dealing with grief in all different kinds of ways, right? Yeah. So it's interesting to see that. But um, for me, um, yeah, I, 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 I see how this is such an important topic so i'm so glad that we we're able to spotlight on this today absolutely and as you talk about dealing with the youth and dealing with um young adults um mm -hmm. they're up against so many challenging things where things are changing and they're trying to keep up with so many things that cause it causes a different type of pressure for them to perform mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. so grief like you said comes in different colors and shapes and do you find, I know young, back in the day, there was a lot of children, young people in high school and going to college that was going through grief, but then it turned mm -hmm. into a more serious um, mental, health, mental health issue like schizophrenia. So a lot yeah. of people don't know that a lot of children that leave home to go to college and it, it turns on while they're in school. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's so interesting. You don't realize that until they're off in college wondering, okay, why all of a sudden I'm feeling in such a, like there's a difference in me. There's something just not right, right? Because sometimes they were able to, in a way, mask that when they were in high school. And then all of a sudden they're off in college and it's a whole different environment, whole situation, right? Yes. Mental illness starts coming up and they start realizing that, you know, there's just something not right here. And then that's when they are actually, hopefully at that time, are able to advocate for themselves and get the help that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Where the behavior doesn't spin out. And then, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes meds are needed. Sometimes it is. And I know I've witnessed that. Another thing that I've realized that, like you said, grief comes in so many different packages, Madeline, like yes. about when, when children went divorce, right? When oh, parents, absolutely. Do you deal with a lot of that? Absolutely. And see, with working with adolescents, um, I noticed that a lot of their mental illness or grief or anything that they're going through, a lot has to do with the home environment. They're really affected by certain things that are going on. For example, you touched on divorce, the conflict between the mom and dad. Sometimes they, real, they don't realize the negative impact that the children are having, yeah. right? Because of it, they're witnessing, they're arguing or going yeah. back and forth, or probably yes. there's a triangulation between the mother, the child, right? And the father. So there's this dynamic that's impact true. that's going on that all of a sudden they're carrying so much, right? With them and the loss of perhaps not seeing a parent there, yes. right? Yes. The parent might, maybe one of the parent moved on or moved away. 
And that grief that the child is dealing with is so overwhelming. And Absolutely. I've noticed that I actually work with children that are yeah. dealing with that. I dealt mm-hmm. with that growing up, you know, um, I was dealing with not even understanding that I was dealing with grief, grief mm-hmm. and um, depression, not mm-hmm. being able to identify it. Right. And I remember a time when my mom and my dad, you know, they weren't getting along and, and, and it was an issue in the house. My father was an incredible, wonderful person, you know, but alcohol was mm-hmm. his mistress. And so mm-hmm. there was always that dynamic in the house. And I mm-hmm. remember being young and I remember when he when he had to leave, you know, and although he was he was active, he worked, he, you know, he brought a check home. But my father yeah. was really a quiet man. He didn't give vo- voice to us as children. He just was so quiet because he didn't have a father. So, mm. you know, how that generational thing spent. Absolutely. And I didn't know I was dealing with grief. And that I was mm. emotionally declining. I would sink in and, and not because I'm an introvert. So I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't speak about it. But it showed mm-hmm. up later in life. It showed up. Mm-hmm. It did show mm-hmm. up. And it, was, mm-hmm. it did show up. And I realized that, like you said, the divorce with my mom. And when they got divorced, my father separated. That's when I began to um, change, you know, mm. because uh, I began to change. There was this missing link there. And then I remember... Then I bumped into um, Coco's dad, Pache's dad, Mm -hmm. who really filled the blank in in my life at that time and brought a spark of joy to Mm. me. And although I was a young girl and, you know, but still that missing link of the dad, he came along. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, you know, after the day Coco, you you know, her story, our story, Mm -hmm. you know, he was taken away from us. So Mm -hmm. that grief compounded and the compounding of the grief, the layers. So how do you... How do you manage? I know. How do you manage? Because for me, I made so many different wrong choices um, mm-hmm. from the foundation of living and making decisions off of grief. And then we're going to go to Coco put up. Oh, yeah. my, you know, when I say Coco, Pache, I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> it's my daughter. I, I'm so sorry. She said that's the missing uh, mm-hmm. conception about grief when you were talking earlier. I meant to put that comment up about grief just comes in one color. And so mm-hmm. how do you deal with, because when in my age, you know, back then it was like, oh, my mother would say, I just love her. I'm going to love her. She don't need nobody but me. No, right. ma'am. You know, in <laughs> hindsight, I needed a counselor. I needed a therapist. Yes. I needed right. someone to talk to me to get me through that trial and tribulation, right? Yes. So how, yes, would, yes. how do you deal with that with the youth and people? Well, this is some of the things that I've seen is that a lot of the the way um, students react or cope with their grief is based on what they've seen growing up. And some of this misinformation, misconception has been through childhood. Some things that they've that I've noticed that they've done is probably um, grieve alone. Maybe they've seen a parent separate, isolate or perhaps be strong, right? I can't show that emotion. So they, what happens, they kind of stuff it up inside them mm-hmm. or replace the loss. Like um, one of the things is, well, you know, if they break up with a partner, a boyfriend and girlfriend, all of a sudden, boom, they're off mm-hmm. to, to the next one. There's mm-hmm. no time to kind of process those feelings, right? So right. it's almost like, okay, we're on to the next one. We're ready or keeping busy, just keeping ourselves free of wanting to kind of dive in and feel the emotion sometimes you have to feel the grief to be able to process that so a lot of these things is learned behavior they see their parents do so they end up doing it right or maybe they might have a terrible day at home they go to one of their parents i had a terrible day you know i got into a fight an argument with my best friend she's no longer talking to me here honey Mm -hmm. Come here, have a cookie. You'll feel better. What happens? Mm-hmm. You're numbing the pain, right? Yes. Or Hispanic family. Here, honey, let me make you some rice and beans. Come sit down. <laughs> food will make it better, right? Comfort. Comfort food. Yes. Exactly, right? Yes. So what happens? That child grows up thinking that they're going to stuff their emotions with food. Mm-hmm. It's no longer the rice and beans. It's that tub of ice cream that you're sitting in front of the TV crying and feeding those emotions. What happens? You're not dealing with the loss. You're not dealing Good with point. the grief, right? So, yeah, because then so it moves to ob- ob- obesity comes in the way now exactly. because of eating emotional eating. I never, ex- I never knew about emotional eating until 
you know, I was in love with my little Yorkie who passed away mm -hmm. not too long mm -hmm. ago, right? I had him since mm -hmm. she was six months and I had never had a pet. The family thought I was nuts because I was always afraid of animals and dogs. <laughs> but for, for mm -hmm. some reason, the Lord put it on my heart. I don't know how that happened. It was a God thing. And mm -hmm. I had her up until she was 14 and it was mm -hmm. just her and I most of the time in the house. And I still mm -hmm. miss her and bump into her clothes. I thought I got rid of and they're still... And I didn't know. And Pache was with me when we had to put her down. And it mm -hmm. felt like my heart yeah. was coming out. I, I, you know, because when they say dogs are a man's best friend, I'm serious. I wish people could love like dogs love. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's such an unconditional love. It's such an unconditional love. And I didn't know. Um, I think, I don't know if it was Pache or one of my daughters said to me, Ma, I said, I'm gaining weight. And I'm eating, how did they say, you had lost weight? I said, I know, I don't know. They said, well, you eating it. And then I started that emotionally eating. Yes. I, I, I touched bases with that. That knocked on my See door. That? And it was a grieving, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a way of me coping. But at the same time, I was gaining something I didn't mm -hmm. want, weight. And yes. So <laughs> and just added to another problem, right? Exactly. <laughs> You have to now deal with the weight. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, you know, death, right? Mm -hmm. Because I know the students and adults, you know, people mm -hmm. deal with death all the time and everyone tries to navigate through it their own way. And sometimes they don't know how to. And then like for me, I, I, I ran, I was a runner. I mm. didn't sit still enough to feel the pain the way I, oh. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I was young. So I was right. a runner. I was a runner. You were keeping as long, busy. As long just as I did busy. that, I wasn't thinking. As long as right. I, was, I was just running, running, running. Mm -hmm. and, but it catches up on you. You know, you neglect yeah. things and people and it started to catch up on me. And then I started. And one day someone asked me, I think it was uh, my counselor when I, before I became a counselor. I don't know. Have, did you ever know um, Torell? Terry Twirell from the New York Christian Counseling Association. Oh, no, no. Mm -mm. He's major. He's the one who started that um, school and counseling center in lower Manhattan. And he uh, asked me a question one day. He said, I don't, he says, have you ever grieved? I was like, hmm. Now, this is years, years no. later. Uh huh. I was like, uh, what do you mean? I'm like, no, I was moving. Yes. So have I stopped long enough to feel every emotion mm -hmm. and address the emotion? No, I tucked the emotion and kept going and kept going. And so mm -hmm. how do you speak to people who have lost ones, you know, lost their loved ones, even young people grieve. And you say you deal because yeah. you work at, you work at uh, Rutgers, you know, you do you deal with a lot of um, young people. And when you kind of yeah. touch on that, another thing that just came across my mind is I want you to share how you manage to counsel the uh, different, how do you say it? Not the genders. Now that you have trans. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And it's that third bathroom that never uh, was around right, before. Right, right, right. Can, can yeah. you tell me on that after you answer the grief problem with adults sure. and how you deal with that? Well, as we know, grief is a normal or natural reaction to loss of any kind. So what we know about grief is, is that universal and each and every person is going to grieve differently. If grief is based on the relationship that you had, you know, what, how are you going to um, cope with those emotions depends on you. So we, I like to always touch on that relationship that mm. they had with the person. Okay. How was that relationship with you? Because if you're, let's say, for example, your mother passed and my mother passed, but you had a great relationship and I might have had a combative relationship with my mom. Do I know how you feel? Oh, no. Yeah, no, no, no. It's too different. I know how I felt when my, right. you know, that person passed away. It's two different relationships. So I like to kind of touch um, with the student or the adult as to how was that relationship for you? Was there any um, undelivered communication that you felt like you couldn't share? Was there any um, shattered dreams or hopes or things that you wish could have been better or more, right? Or different in that relationship? Because sometimes after a loss, we end up with those things that we wish could have been different, but we you know, didn't have that opportunity to share with that person that passed away. So I kind of like to have that 
person explore that relationship. I like That's to good. do uh, what's called a relationship graph That's and kind of detail per like a, a timeline of that relationship, starting from the beginning all the way to the end. And yeah. where in that relationship were those things that you feel like you couldn't share? Okay, let's let's explore that. I yes. like to go with the client through certain things. Like, were there things that perhaps you felt like you needed to apologize for? Right. Were there things that you felt like you needed to um, maybe ask for forgiveness? Like I said, apologies, or maybe apologize the, uh, you know, say sorry for that person, or in a way like, you know, almost forgive that other person. That's what right. I'm trying to say. Yes. forgive that other person for what they've done or didn't yes. do right yes. and then certain things that you wish you could have said maybe some thank yous acknowledge yes. their relationship or things perhaps that did not go well and kind of put that in the spotlight That's so good. when we have that relationship graph and we've lined it out the person is able to then kind of put it all together and i like to end it um with a completion letter writing that person a letter as to you know some of those things that are from those categories which is apologies forgiveness and like the significant emotional statements and you put that all together in one letter and then i have that client read that letter to me and it almost like kind of relieves uh, releases them from all of that emotion yes. that they've bottled up inside them that's really good because it's a freeing you need yes. to be free because many times when people pass they want to say, oh, I, I didn't never forgive them. And I never said something to them. And then they walk around with another layer of guilt in their yes, life. Right. And, my, and so that is so true. That's why I think it's so important that, you know, to share with your loved ones, whether you're close to them or not, how you feel, you know, and, and so that you know, I said it, I tried yes. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because when people, you know, tomorrow's not promised to us. And sometimes mm -hmm. pride pulls us back pride i'm not doing it because they did that to me and so many things and then when a person is gone then you're going through a whole nother level like you said of, mm -hmm. of problems and now you're walking but when you do that letter the letter is really powerful when you sit like that letter and say what you would say to it oh frees you let's look it at does. some of the comments uh pache for the comment and then we'll see what else is here she says i think it's great that adolescents are able to voice what they are feeling i think it's a disservice to tell a child what goes on in this house stays in this house yeah we teach mm -hmm. them to suppress and that's a we big do. word suppress and that is right. so true Pache, yes. that is so very very true and she and put true. their feelings she suppress their feelings that mm -hmm. is so true the suppression now brings you also like you're saying it's going to bring you right to the same counseling room and the couch speak a little bit about the suppression exactly that and when they suppress it right and then they feel that that's the way that they have to behave because they find that as the their coping mechanism they end up growing to be adults with other problems right they can suppress yeah. it with alcohol they can suppress it with drugs right how many kids right now that i'm dealing with are using drugs right because they're suppressing their feelings right yes. with that it's a temporary relief but they're not going deeper they're not going in in dealing with the pain right yes. or perhaps they become adults in what is it shopping uh retail therapy right yes. using that yeah. car shopping shopping it feels good getting that pair of shoes but then all of a sudden you're left with the debt <laughs> right so retail That's therapy so is massive right now but um, yeah. those are the things we really want to hone into this generation of students to be able to yeah. help them to understand that they're in a safe space to be able to share their feelings, I that you, they so can good. always come to a counselor and some, you know, build a relationship of rapport somewhere where they can feel like they can share without feeling judged, analyzed or criticized. Absolutely. Right. And that's so Absolutely. important. And May has a comment and they, I have to give her a special hello. She's my day one. She is responsible for this uh, show tonight and on the other channel. She, her and Pastor Rose are the sponsors this month. She says, guilt can make you feel like you're a hostage. Ooh, Ooh, that's good. In a mental prison. That'll preach, Ooh. girl. You better watch yourself. <laughs> that is so good. That is so good. And I, I really appreciate that because you know what? We're a lot of us when we go through grief also can be battling guilt right 
things oh, that they yeah. wish could have been different, things that perhaps they didn't do and now they don't oh. longer have the chance, right? To do oh, it. Oh yeah. Oh so yeah. So much of that guilt is also underneath all that's, that pain. Ooh, that's a loss. big one. Yeah. That's a big one. Oh mm -hmm. my God. And I tell you, so I think there's another comment here that we want to read. Uh, let's see. Oh, Dawn B. Hey, niece. Dawn B is in the house. Dawn Brathway. She is here. You see your partner up here, Dawn? See what All she's right. doing? Yeah, Dawn is in the house. Hey, we thank Dawn. you for being here. Mother Rosa, Pastor Rosa is in the house. And Pache so has good. another um, comment. I think it's good to bury and grieve the dream of what we thought we would be so we can move forward to who we are becoming uh you but mm. look we got some preachers in here wow Madeline, what they what they what they doing tonight <laughs> to us what are they doing that's I love really all these comments yeah that right? is... we can also grieve the the missing hopes or dreams things oh. expectations right those Ooh, are the that's... intangible losses how Listen. many of our loss of trust right those are the things that people don't realize are also losses right you things gotta, that ooh. we realize we need to grieve those things right or even perhaps for example uh parents when their ch uh, child graduates from high school and they go oh. off to college yes empty nesters right they're grieving right yes. or even the child that goes to college is grieving, grieving. right the normal yes thing. no longer at home the the students that or the friends that they once have they no longer have maybe new environment new state those are all yes. lost this grief yeah, I mean, just living is so hard to navigate life, you know, Absolutely. based on the, the hand that you have to um, that you're dealt and you mm -hmm. have to deal with it and you have to figure it. But what happens sometimes is we tuck things away because life keeps spinning us, you know, exactly. so when, as you get up, you're in your day, you're in it and you really deal with yourself by the time you realize it is years that pass and and you start feeling a certain way. And like, mm -hmm. you know, like we was talking about that I've dealt with a lot of death personally right and um like the young age but i also said my mom her and i she was my go-to i couldn't get myself together i just could not get myself together mm -hmm. then it was so 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 oh my god I, I don't have words so again what do you do with that you you know at right. a certain point you got to get up and do something with it but back to mm -hmm. your children and the people in uh the ruckus in school where you're counseling and dealing is there a ratio of, is it just a general population? Do you see more of uh, African-American students suffering more than Latinos or, or, or Caucasians? Is there, what is the kind of the, the ruler for a thumb ruler? How would that be expressed? Well, I right now I deal with all different kinds of populations. I mm -hmm. see Caucasians, African-Americans, Latinos, Latinas. So um, basically what I've seen, and if I go dive and i dive deeper within you know um i can see that there's just an equal balance between all there's mm -hmm. areas in their life that probably they haven't dealt with and they figured you know let me mask it with something else come in with that and yeah. all of a sudden when we go deeper we realize that there's been a lot of trauma and loss things yes. that uh, they have dealt with that yes. perhaps they're come, you know, they don't want to open up. They're they're masking it. They have this facade, right? Nothing's wrong. I'm good. But when you go deeper, you realize that a lot of these kids have come from broken homes or, um, you know, things that they've seen in their family environment that have been so traumatic that they've um, not. They're you know they probably react in anger, right? Or mm -hmm. they come out and start behaving in such a way. Perhaps they get into fights a lot. Why are you right. fighting? What's going on? They're using these other things to mask the pain, right? right. And Definitely. so we kind of realize, okay, let's work deep, or let's go in here and let's um, try to dive in as to what's the root cause of that. Yeah. And the cultural yeah. diversity, learning, you understanding the different cultures that are within cultures because, mm -hmm. you know, there's a culture within a culture. So... When you go behind closed doors, there's a culture actually in your apartment, in your home. Yes, right, right. right. And so dealing with different um, nationalities, I'm sure you have different things that you yeah. deal with based on their culture in their home, mm -hmm. their family culture. You know, that we don't do that, we do this, we don't do it this way, that exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. Right, right. And, and there's also this bias with counseling, too. And I've seen that within cultures. Oh, we don't share other, pe other people or problems. Right? What do you mean, you mental illness? 
get over it here, you know, walk it off, like Um, shake it off. What are you talking about? Depressed? Come on, in the Hispanic culture, they'll look at you like, you're depressed? No, you're not depressed. Go outside and play. Like, what is going on, you know? So (laughs) there's certain things that I see that um, some parents might not be supportive of the child coming in to see me, right? Because there's this this bias or this um, this thought that maybe they don't need it. My child is perfectly fine. But when you come and talk to these kids, you realize, no, they're, they're not. They're, they're crying out yes. for help. And yes. they're actually misbehaving or acting out because they're crying out for, yes. you know, for help. Yes, yeah, that's sad. So that. you know, that's sad because that's like, you know, they want a family to look a certain kind of way. And then the, at the cost of their child, at the cost mm-hmm. of, you know, to a fault where they won't allow them to speak or whatever. And that's when children a lot of times turn to, I've seen um, young girls um, when I, back in the day when I was counseling more teens, um, mm-hmm. be very promiscuous. Yes. Oh my God. Like. See that a lot. Yes. I see that a lot. And you wonder what's going on, you know, and why are you feeling like you have to dress like this? Well, you know, it makes me feel good. It's attention seeking, but a lot of it has to do with their self-confidence, the, you know, these these thoughts that go through their mind that they have to dress a certain way to kind of get that reaction from other people. But, you know, they're feeding off some pain, right? That makes them yes. feel like they need to showcase to the world their body because, you know, True. True. And, and it's not the way. It's not right. But, um, yeah, it's it's that's what I'm seeing, too. Yeah. Dawn put a comment. Gems are being, <laughs> gems are being <laughs> dropped tonight. We better grab them up. That's Amen. right, Amen. right, right. And I don't know if that's cracking a joke or you have to send them away. I don't know what that was too, but she said it Maybe with the kids? Yeah, send them away, <laughs> you go home and get changed because you wonder what's going on, right? But I feel like as the count, the you know, the counselor in the school, I have to kind of like help them to realize I'm here to help you. Like I'm coming alongside you, right? It's in you, right? It's all in you. Now I'm gonna help you to kind of, hey there, um, pull that out, right? Because we're all are, you know, we have control of what we do, but sometimes we need someone else to kind of guide us through and make those right choices. Right. Yeah, and sometimes absolutely. they just need a helping hand and and a kind of like you're kind of like um, lighting the path for that that child. Yes, come, yes. I'll come alongside you. Let's yes. do this together. And as counselors and therapists, you know, we have to remain not non judgmental. Exactly. You know, um, mm-hmm. even I know that's a challenge for some people who are believers. But if they're not called to love people, then they shouldn't be in this position mm-hmm. to try to help people. Right? right, because um, they don't know how to separate. Mm-hmm. They they don't know how to separate. And um, what I was a- alluding to before, because uh, I was talking to my, he's my godson, and he's at John Jay College. He's grown up, went up the ladder, and did a lot with kids, basketball, youth, and everything. And we were talking one time, and he was sharing with me. That's when he was sharing with me about transgenders in schools mm-hmm. now, because I totally mm-hmm. forgot about that yeah. population being, I've been out of the school system, out of that part of council so long. And yeah. we were chatting and then I was like, yeah, I said, he said, well, you should get into school and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't know. I think that might've passed me by. I don't know if I'm ready, you know, really? willing to get into it. Yeah, I don't know, get into I school. I think you can. Yeah, I mean, I know youth relate to me. There's not one sector of people that can't relate to me at all. I've never Absolutely. experienced somebody not being able to share with me and they know mm-hmm. it goes nowhere else. And he was like, mm-hmm. I think, you know, mom, I think. And I said, well, tell me about what's going on currently. And then we got on the topic of mm-hmm. transgenders. Yes. And now um, I said, my God, how are they treated? Like mm-hmm. she said, he was saying how it's rough. It's sometimes it's very rough because people can be very mean. Do you yes. experience that population at Rutgers? Well, I work for Rutgers, but I'm in school base, so I'm in a school district. Yep. Uh So I see that. And a lot of them have to deal with, you know, certain um, critiques or comments or things that they say to that person that can be very hurtful. 
And so I, you know, I worked with one in particular that actually dealt with a lot of anxiety. They couldn't go to the school, didn't want to go to school, didn't want to go inside a classroom, um, had a lot of social anxiety and depression. And you see that a lot of it um, due to their age and then going through this transition, they're being, it's a, it's a, they go through a lot, right? Emotionally, but as well, physically as well. So you see that they're dealing with so much and it's just compounded and it's just built on on top of one another that they don't know how to react. Their body is changing on top of taking hormones. This changes and it's just, it, I, I hate to say this, but it messes them up in such a way that yeah. they don't know how to react. They don't know how to cope. So yeah. I, I saw that in one in particular student that was going through a lot of the anxiety and depression, but their minds were all over the place because they couldn't adjust to wow. who they were made to be to then something that they were transitioning to. And it was just all jumble mumble. It was just a lot to deal with. And that's, for me, it's heartbreaking, yes. right? That's for me, it's heartbreaking I'm as a sure. clinician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you want to break through. You want to break yes. through and get get them to yes. the other get them to exactly. the other side. The exactly be, right. They'll be busy. They'll they'll be messing with the mindset and everything. Gosh. <laughs> well, that is very definitely. It, it can be a very it could, it could be a challenge. That's for sure. Yes. yes. Well, yes, share yes. a little bit more about your experience as um what caused you to um when did you know you wanted to be a clinician and like how mm -hmm. did you start? You know, I, I know that. You became a writer, right? Mm -hmm. And yes. I remember you on the team and you wrote in. Which book was that that you um you wrote? Doing in? it afraid. Doing yes, it afraid. Yes. Doing it yes, afraid. Yes, I think you have Doing a guest afraid. in the house. You have a guest of in the course. house. Oh, there we go. Hello, hello. <laughs> so yes, I wrote I co wrote with um wonderful group of women, um, doing it afraid, and I detailed my experience with agoraphobia. And for those who don't know what agoraphobia is, is the fear of being outdoors. I suffered for um, with agoraphobia for a year and a half. And really? that for me was a giant loss. That for me was grief in itself because I lost normalcy. I lost who I was as a person, what I used to be. I grieved the old me because when I could no longer do those things, I felt like um, I lost a piece of me, right? So during that time, I literally would not go out. I, if I did, it was literally run to the store and come back. Mm -hmm. And it, it shook me up. It really took a toll of my day-to-day -day life. But yeah. I thank God for his healing. I was able to press through that yes. with prayer and just constant battling. It was an everyday thing. And let me tell you, it might have been good day one day, but then the next day was the same thing over and over again. The battle was ongoing. But finally, after a year and a half, I was able to be set free and wow. healed from that, that I'm able to now share my experience with Thank others. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Thank you. But, mm -hmm. but Madeline, what triggered that? Because that was something that just came on set. It was kind of yeah. just like you woke mm -hmm. up and all of a sudden fear gripped you. Totally. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. It was so instant. Like I remember dropping off my kids off to school. I was a stay at home mom. And then all of a sudden it was just like, boom, it hit me so hard that I immediately was succumbed with fear. And I was literally in panic mode, wow. even going to do things that I once used to do. I was shocked that I was, I couldn't do it. I couldn't. And, I, and then I started losing my freedom as of going and, and driving because I was in panic mode. I would have panic attacks on the roads. I would have literally go to the store and if I happened to see someone and they knew me, I would literally start having an anxiety attack because I didn't really? want to be seen. Yes, there were moments where I literally would have a panic attack at the, at the supermarket and literally just have to like cash out, do what I need to do quickly and run home. And I was just at those, at, during those difficult moments, I remember being so upset and angry and crying out to God. I was like, but well, why would you allow this to happen? Why, where did this come what from? What happened? happened? Yes. Why would I be going through this? And I would tell him, I want to go back to the person that I was. 
to yes. do the things that I once used to do. Yes. But he made it so clear to me that he said, I am not taking you back to that same old Madeline. I'm be <laughs> I am making you a new, a new person, <laughs> someone that knows how to battle, right? Someone yes. who gets on her knees every single day yes. and fights the enemy. And that's what I was doing, literally battling every day. And I, in that moment in time, I grew stronger in the Lord. I became a warrior for God because I knew where the enemy was using my thoughts, right? Yes. To capture fear in me. Because remember, like our the battlefield is in the mind. So what That's happens? Right. Your thoughts affect your feelings, your feelings yes. affect your behavior. So the yes. moment the enemy had my thoughts, boom, I yes. started feeling a certain kind of way. Yes. I was fearful and I started behaving like I couldn't go out, right? Because I was yeah. so scared. Yeah. So once I started realizing, no, I've got to use the weapon and yes. that's the, you know, the word I started yes. battling back and that's I started right. getting my freedom back and I started reclaiming back what the locust has taken from me. Yes. So I started yes. moving forward into that freedom. That is incredible. Yeah. That is such a testimony and go figure, look what kind of work you're doing now. Right. Look at that, yes, right? Just look exactly. at how you, you, you know, that experience and you're right. You, if we let things park in our mind long enough without disputing it with the word of God, it creeps exactly. down into our emotions and then we behave. I tell people yeah. all the time, if I think about my mother for a certain length of time and see her in the casket, I'm a cry because mm. I didn't exactly. let it sit too long. It didn't travel. Right. It got me now. But yeah. if I think about a joke, right, the same way I can think about a funny joke you tell me. What am I going to do? I think about it. I'm going to laugh. You're going to laugh. Yeah, exactly. Because, right? yeah, like you said, that emotion. So I've always learned, and I learned that years ago, dispute it with the word of God. If you know mm -hmm. one word, say it. If you know one scripture, say it. Exactly. I'm more than the conqueror. I'm more than the conquering question. I'm more than, eventually, your mind will yes. shift. But yes. you're right. The mind is the devil's playground, and they have a campfire up there if we let them park there and sit too long. Exactly right, and, and that can just, happen, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, exactly, I, and and that's exactly with the grief, right? If we stay there, in that grief, it can fester and it can keep us trapped. And what happens if you don't? If you stay there, it ends up becoming to what depression, right? Yes. Something even much more serious. So. We really want to be able to make sure that we don't stay in our grief, right? We need to move and get ourselves out of that so we can move forward, right? Yes, that's, yes. That's the and it's, it's, it's so awesome, you know, talking about all of these different topics because it's very difficult for many people based on mm -hmm. how they're wired, how to navigate, and when they don't speak mm -hmm. up and they're in sadness or whatever. But I know in dealing with in the business of counseling and being a clinician, and I know for me one of the happiest things is to see someone get through, someone mm -hmm. break through, someone oh, no so longer good. have to come into the sessions. You just say, I'm yes. here whenever you need me. But exactly. you're done. They really like, no, I'm not done. No, you're done. Yes. You know, I'm still here. What are some right. of the things, uh, some of the uh, students or some of the people that you have had in your presence, uh, those, I guess we'll call them success stories? Yes. Oh, I love it. When they have, um, when you see that there's progress, right? Um, I also facilitate a grief group. So when I deal with the, um, in this group, I, I work with adults, right? So when they, when we talk about these things and I give them the tools on how to help them navigate through loss and it clicks and it's yeah. like their aha moment, it's yes. like, yes, <laughs> yes, you got it. Yes. And you can celebrate with them. Right. Yes. Or when I'm with a student and all these things that I've been teaching them, like coping strategies, right. How yes. to regulate your emotions, right. <laughs> How to deescalate and they finally do it and they share it with you yes. and you see the light in their eyes and the I joy in their, it. in their face with a yes. smile. You're like, and you get so happy. You celebrate you, with them. It, yes. It's like, I I'm so that, proud of you. I love that moment. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I, I know for me, when that happened, when I was going through counseling, and you know, Oprah mm -hmm. says the aha. Uh -huh. My thing is yeah. when they sit, when they go, oh, oh, like <laughs> when they get it, like, oh, that's oh, right. that's good. Yes, that's that's so it. Good. That's the thing. I mean, uh -huh. that's what I said. I was like, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I was like, okay, I, I got it. the answer. I right, got the, right. I got it. It clicked on, you know. Yeah, and it's amazing when you see that because you want to see people free. You want to mm -hmm. see people be unlocked, right? Right. To go to Absolutely. that next place called there. 
Let's see what yeah. some of our comments are saying, because I know it's almost time for you to leave and mm -hmm. you promise to come back, right? I will, as long okay. as you want me and have me, yes. I definitely will come back. We want you, we want you, let's right. see. Uh, okay, so we have Ben Aragon. Is this your there. husband? <laughs> yes. Brother, it's your husband. <laughs> Amen. <Well>, hey, Ben, <laughs> how are you? Aww. Thanks for being here. All right, you got he has a comment. Let's see what this cuts, it's a question. Oh. Tell us about a success story from someone going through grief. Oh adult or okay. young people oh well look he said that right on time as we were talking about it there we go okay yes like i said i um facilitate a grief group and just to be able to see um that they're able to take in those tools that i share right um how to cope with the grief or perhaps those things that they used to do to be able to uh deal with the loss that they saw were misinformation, right? Like grieve alone or you know, um, perhaps um, put on a happy face. Like we want mm. to show others that we're okay, but in reality, we're in so much pain, yes. right? So when they finally see that these things have that they've done are no longer working for them, they're able to make those changes that changes their lives, not only yes. for themselves, but for the for their generation, right? Yes. For their children and their children's children, because something has changed. Now yes. they're able to share their feelings, right? Amen. They're able to communicate. And then yes. all of a sudden their children are seeing them being open and honest about their feelings. If mommy's not okay, and that's okay, right? right. To not right. be okay. But that changes that whole family dynamic. And I love seeing that because um, when they're able to say to me, Maddie, thank you so much. I didn't realize I was doing that. And it was not only hurting me, but my children. I'm going to make a change and I'm going to do things differently. I love it when they tell me that. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. My slogan, as you see under this thing, is when nothing changes, nothing changes. Exactly right. Something has to change. Something exactly. has to shift. It can't, mm -hmm. it just has to, or else you just keep spinning out of control. And exactly. point to being finger pointers and, you know, because a lot of times the spirit of humility is the breakthrough, I believe. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. don't have to be right. You know, you just right. want to be pleasing to what God expects of you. And sometimes you have to go low for someone to get free. So it's not mm -hmm. about who's right or who's wrong. Humility can take you so many places inside internally as well as in your natural life. So yeah. um, I have um, you have another family member in the in the house. Hold on, let's see. Oh boy, <laughs> Kayla. Oh, hi, Kayla. Nice to see you. Hi. Hey, that's my daughter. <laughs> that's I was Kayla. gonna say. That there we go. Uh, here we go. <laughs> How would you help a friend who is grieving, mm. but you don't know you don't have the words? That's a good mm. question. That's a good one, and that's the thing right now. A lot of people um might know someone who's grieving right they might have experienced a loss but they don't know how to how to behave around them because it could be a touchy thing right sometimes they don't know what to say but sometimes not saying anything is the best thing just be a heart with ears just listen to the person be there sit with them just let them know i'm here for you i know i can't imagine what you're going through but i just want you to know that i, I care and i love you and just know that I'm going to sit here with you and just be there for you. And it's almost like you help them name their feelings, right? What are you yeah. going through? What are you feeling? Is it sadness? Is it anger? Right? Give them a voice. Help them to um, identify those things that are causing them the pain. Are yes. you isolating yourself? I noticed that you haven't been reaching out or um, don't answer my phone calls. I'm concerned. I want you to know that I'm here. Empathy is so important because yes. when you empathize with the person, they know that you're there for them and that yes. you're being true and honest to what yes. they're going through. It's so important to be empathetic. It's true. I like you mm -hmm. said, have be a heart with ears. I love yes. that. Yes, I yes, love yes. That. I Absolutely. Love that. And, and stay in the present moment with the them. Present. You don't yes. have to really say right. something intellectual because those intellectual comments might not be helpful yeah. right yeah so just stay true to your heart and true to them at that moment and you know that you'll be able to be a support system for them yeah because that'll trigger most times when you come from that place they'll wind up talking because you're Absolutely. giving them the love 
and the cushion mm -hmm. and you're saying out loud, I'm not judging you. You're saying, exactly. I'm here. I know for me, a lot of times when people don't want to open up or they're afraid to, I, I'd say, just give me one word. Find uh -huh. one word what you're feeling. Just one, just dig for it. Exactly. And, then, and I'll wait. Yes. I'll wait. Just give me uh -huh. one word. And then, and then they are like, okay, there we go. There we yeah. go. Okay, we saw That's it there. And yeah, and you're right, like, um, and your daughter, that was an incredible question. That's, that's a good a, question. That was a good question, and that's the question of that. her generation. I don't know how old is she. She's 28. Okay, so that, that generation still have a lot of questions, don't know how to, because there's so many different things that's going mm -hmm. on today. Things have changed, but I think that was an incredible, and I think your yeah. answer to her, if, she, if she's dealing with that and she can share, that'll open mm -hmm. somebody up to tell you Look, mm -hmm. I, well, I wasn't going to say anything, but you've given them, you eased in and said, you can yes. trust me. You can exactly. Trust me. You invited them to come in, come in. Yes. I'm here for you, right? Let's invite yes. you in, right? Yes. So just know yes. that I'm here to support you through it. That's the most it, important thing. I love it. I love it. Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to say? We did good. We did it right under hour. We could have gone yes. later. It's all on you. It's your, it's your <laughs> show. It's your thing. Um, is whatever I tell you I was going I knew you was going to pull stuff out of me I thought I, was gonna, I thought I would sit and be quiet and let you just talk through right. the whole thing but oh you know. no this was great conversation on <laughs> such an important topic and um for anyone who's um actually going through grief experienced a loss I am going to be hosting another round of grief uh grief groups starting May 7th at 7 p.m it's virtual you can just reach out to me at griefrecoveryday at gmail.com for more information. Griefrecoveryday at gmail.com. I'll say you it again. It. Griefrecoveryday at gmail.com. Right? I didn't have that information early else it would have been on the banner, but she just <laughs> said it to you. And yeah. um, that is how people can get in touch with you. And when is that date again for the next round of Yes, this is going to be an eight-week virtual uh, support group, and it will begin Tuesday, May 7th at 7 p.m. I'm going to write that down. Oh, 7 o'clock. Oh, oh it's definitely going to be a spot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 7 p.m. Oh. Oh. 7 p.m., but I will pass it on. Mm -hmm. I will definitely pass that on. Wow. 7 p.m. I might have yeah, to and if, if someone is not interested in a grief group, they can always contact me. We can work on one-on-one -on -one, uh, grief work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I got the best moderator in the YouTube street, so I knew she was wow, going to go Wow, I it, love oh, that. Oh, yeah, that's my day one. She is something. She is something. So there it is for those of you that want to reach out. I think that you should do it. It's going to be absolutely wonderful. Absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful. Pache is saying, great job. Great thank job. you. Thank you. Great thank you. Job. This was great. Yes. And um, Madeline, Maddie, as they call her, she uh -huh. has said that she will come and uh, be with us. And she might get some invitations from, um, we got Elaine Sanders and Pache Felton with their night on uh, Monday nights at seven o'clock. They might <laughs> invite you to talk about oh, a couple wonderful. of things, you know, with relationships so or whatever. Oh, yes. So, you know, I just really, really, I'm so grateful that you came on. I'm so Thank grateful you. that you felt the pull and the tug. Cause I told you mm -hmm. when you called, I said, I was thinking about it. I was thinking yes. about it. So um, stay tuned for more of Maddie. She'll be back. And on um, Monday night, Monday night, uh, what's it? Monday night, open mic. What is the name of the show? Monday Beyond the Mic. Monday oh, Beyond yes. the Mic. Monday's Beyond the Mic with Pache Felton and Elaine Sanders. And of course, you have me on Tuesdays. And uh, this Tuesday coming up, we had Karen and Ghana on Tuesday. This Tuesday passed. Next Tuesday, we have Reggie, C. Reggie Rogers, the relationship, number one relationship coach. We'll have him coming on. And I was so excited with Maddie coming on. And she's going to come back hopefully monthly. She might be able to drop mm -hmm. in and talk Absolutely. to us about particular topics. Because I think it'll be awesome to keep mm -hmm. empowering and keep enriching lives with guests like this. With people that come and drop these jewels, like Dawn B said. And so uh, keep tuning in to Bravo, the Bravo with Sheila Network. I hope, 
enjoy and hope that you hit that thumbs up button. Remember, we're trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. We are at 800 something. I'm not sure. Woo! At 800, Amazing. we're pushing, we're pushing. Amazing. We need those watch hours. They get us, that YouTube gets us, but you're fighting for 4,000 watch hours. People think it's easy to get, but it's not, but we're doing it. <laughs> we are doing it. And those of you who are believers and who love the Lord like I do, like we do, mm -hmm. you can cross the YouTube streets and go to the Sheila Ingram Ministry Broadcast Network and tune in to some wonderful things that we have over there. Fridays at 11 a.m., Women of Grace. We are walking through the lives of the women of the Bible. It has been Ooh. awesome. Every Friday morning at 11 a.m. It's been incredible. We have Pastor Rosa Griffin on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. on the Sheila Ingram um, Ministry Broadcast Network. And we're just put, bringing other people on the platform to spread the word of the Lord, also to build people up. But here in this Bravo sector, we're not a gospel or a, a Christian channel, but y'all know we believe it. So, you know, you get what you get. And we That's just right. thank you so much. Last words to you. I will yield for you to give the last words to uh, the people here. Before we do that, let's put up Inez's comment. Thank you for being so transparent mm -hmm. at Madeline Aragon. And I'm so proud of you mm -hmm. for overcoming. Oh, yes. Yeah, so Thank you so much. Yeah. Give last words to the viewers and people that will come later to see this. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that you're not alone. And if you are going through some kind of loss, um, you know that there is someone that you can reach out to. There's someone that cares and really um, is there to guide you through this process so if you are in need of help please reach out to me i'm here to navigate through this with you um and know that you can you can uh, go through this process and you will come out of it better i believe that i believe that you are not your circumstances and you definitely have like me um great things in store for you and so i believe that right god has a plan for you and definitely will it'll come to fruition absolutely i love it so thank I you so it. much sheila i really appreciate this time this opportunity this was an amazing um show and um thank you i look forward to coming back again we had a wonderful time and i i mean i love you i love your heart mm -hmm. you know and it's, it's just wonderful it's just wonderful to see you and boy have you such an overcome and you're helping so many people overcome and i mm -hmm. really love your heart your heart is so sweet thank you thank you to your husband and your daughter that is on oh, thank you thank for you. coming to the bravo and um supporting and i really appreciate it those of you up in the balcony the bleaches or maybe you have an expensive ticket and sitting in the orchestra seat Thank you for being here. Hit that like button, that thumbs up button for us. It's free 99. Those of you in the chat, we're going to chat and tip on out of here. Maddie, stay right there. Mm -hmm. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. All right, we're going. We out. We are out. We are out. We are out. Let's go.